We're going to continue our study in the book of Proverbs with chapter 13. Chapter 13 continues to make the contrast between the hard life and the blessed life. And Solomon is urging his son to choose the blessed life. There's so much here in chapter 13 that actually this is the second time I'm teaching this this week. The first time I just, there's so much to expand on and to look at that I went way too long and uh, Facebook wouldn't allow me to upload the video. So I'm going to try to go through chapter 13 and it's going to be rough, but I'm going to try to make my comments as brief as I can. It starts off in verse 1, a wise son accepts his father's discipline. But a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. A wise son accepts his father's discipline. A scoffer does not accept, doesn't listen to rebuke. And what it, he does here in this verse, if you notice, he, he connects rebuking with discipline. Part of learning, part of being instructed is, is rebuking. Uh, we like to be encouraged. We want to be uplifted. We want to be, uh, you know, inspired in some way. But sometimes we just need to be rebuked. We just need to be told that we're wrong. We need to be challenged in what we're doing. When Paul was talking to Timothy. He told him about all Scripture. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for, for uh, correction, for training in righteousness. And notice half the reasons for Scripture there is for rebuke and for correction. Rebuke, telling us where we're wrong in correction that we're going the wrong way to, to direct us into the right path, to correct us in telling us in the right way that we should go. And so it's important for us to be able to be willing to learn, to change, to have a new direction uh, when we find ourselves going in the wrong direction. Now, then, verses 2 through 6 seem to be a cluster of verses that seem to go together. He is focusing on the tongue for one thing, but more than the tongue, he goes right to the heart of things, which is our heart. And he's going to use the word desire and soul. If you look in the margin, the word uh, desire is literally the word soul in the, in the verse 2. And then he continues by using the word soul, which is the inner part of us, where, where things come from. And so listen here as we, we go along in chapters, uh, in verses 2 through 6. From the fruit of a man's mouth, he enjoys good, but the desire of the treacherous is violence. The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. A righteous man hates falsehood, but a wicked man acts disgustingly and shamefully. Righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness subverts the sinner. Here, the fruit of a man's mouth, he enjoy, lets him enjoy good. Have you ever had to eat your own words? How did they taste? Well, actually, they could taste good. We, we think about tasting our words and thinking, now they must be pretty bitter. And he does say the desire of the treacherous is violence. The desire, his soul, the, what he's thinking about. And uh, that's where everything comes from. It comes from what's inside of us. Our words come from what's inside of us. Jesus mentions this in Matthew, the 12th chapter. In Matthew 12, Jesus says, beginning in verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. He says here that you can have a good fruit. You can have good fruit. And that's why Proverbs says you can have good words and they taste good, but you can also be filled with violence. You see, the violence reveals what's in your heart. And the desire of the treacherous is violence. It shows, what's in his heart shows by what he does. The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. 
the one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Um, the prudent person knows that he doesn't need to be telling everything he knows. He doesn't need to be talking all the time. Um, here it is, uh, the man who guards his mouth. I heard a preacher and he was a little uh, Freudian, Freudian slip. He says the, the one who guards his mouth preserves his wife. <laughs> well, that could be true too. What you say might make your marriage better or, or worse. It, it can improve your relationships. And that's what he's talking about here. And then he says, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. And the soul of the diligent is made fat. The soul, again, the desire of the sluggard comes to nothing. The sluggard, the slug, he doesn't work. And his actions reveals what's in his heart. But the soul... Uh, the heart of the diligent is made fat. The idea of fat is uh, abundance. He has everything he needs. A righteous man hates falsehood, but a wicked man acts disgustingly and shamefully. A wicked man uh, loves lies. The wise man, the, the w wise person, the righteous person, he hates lies. Righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness subverts the sinner. Uh, you know, there's so many things that people bring on themselves. He says the righteous man guards the one whose way is blameless. Uh, the wicked subverts the sinners. Uh, there's nothing there to keep the sinner back. He, he has nothing in his heart that will, will draw him back from the murder or the theft or the evil that he wants to do. And jails are filled with people who are, are wicked. Uh, they've brought it on themselves. Verses 7 through 11, another cluster of ideas that seem to focus on the rich. And it also talks about the pride, the proud. Uh, verse 7 through 11. There is one who pretends to be rich, but has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, but has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but the poor hears no rebuke. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked goes out. Through insolence comes nothing but strife, but wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases. So he begins here, the, there's one who pretends to be rich, but has nothing. He, he pretends to be better off than he really is. He doesn't have anything. But then he goes on and says, there's another who pretends to be poor. He's always complaining about his bills and all of his expenses, but he has enough to pay for them. Uh, so they're just trying to pretend that they're really who they're not. And then he goes on that says, says, though the ransom of a man's life is his wealth, which is an interesting comment. The ransom uh, of a man's life is his wealth. We have know of wealthy people whose children have been kidnapped for a ransom. They've had to pay to get their kids back. Uh, in third world countries, their uh, justice system oftentimes is so corrupt that if a righteous person, a wealthy person, is arrested, even though he's innocent, he might have to pay a fine because they know he's wealthy. He might have to give a bribe because that's the way the system works. And yet he says that the poor, make, here's no rebuke. There's no threat for a poor man. He has nothing. No one's going after him. The light of the righteous rejoices. The lamp of the wicked goes out. The light, that which shines from within, that smile that you have on your face. The righteous person has a lot to look forward to. The wicked man, there is sadness and darkness. And that's what he's talking about. Through insolence, now there's a word that we don't use very often. I like here in the King James Version, here's one of those times where the King James Version is actually easier to understand than the New American Standard Version. The King James says that through pride comes nothing but strife, but wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Through pride, uh, there are those who are proud and it causes contention. Uh, because usually when you're proud, you think, I'm right. 
my my side is right my way of thinking is right and here in this political in this political season we hear this all the time people uh listen to what they believe and they re, uh, regurgitate what they believe and oh, we're the right side the other side says no ours is the right position and we just focus on what we believe and it causes a lot of contention he says but the wise man he has a lot of counselors he listens to both sides and and weighs it and balances it out. Pride, you know, the real problem with pride is what's right in the very middle. <laughs> the eye. The eye and pride. Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. Well, that's pretty easy to understand. Wealth obtained by fraud. The get rich quick schemes. Uh, the easy come, easy go. Uh, it didn't cost you much to get it, so you're not going to take good care of it. I see this often happen in property. Uh, a kid will get his parents' property and he won't take care of it because he didn't have to work for it. But the one who obtained the wealth by hard labor, he says, uh, he'll increase it. He knew how hard this was to get. He's going to take care of it. He's going to allow it to uh, and be improved. And so uh, it's uh, telling us that you know it's better to work hard for for what you get. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Uh, you, you know that, that uh, you know, when you have something you really want and you don't get it, it makes your heart sick. Uh, but to get that, it's like a tree of life to have your, your needs fulfilled. Now, in verses 13 through 18, again, there's a, a cluster of of ideas here and most of it seem to be the consequences of despising God are the blessings that come with honoring God the one who despises the word will be in debt to it but the one who fears the commandment will be rewarded the teaching of the wise is a fountain of life to turn aside from the snares of death good understanding produces favor but the way of the treacherous is hard every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool displays folly. A wicked messenger falls into adversity, but a faithful envoy brings healing. Poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline, but he who regards reproof will be honored. Uh, the one who despises the word, you'll be in debt to it. Uh, the one who does not honor God, there's the consequences here respect god uh most sinners have pains and and sorrows and so many that we wonder how can they live without god and they just don't seem to to want to turn aside to god and he says here good understanding produces favor but the way of the treacherous is hard it's difficult how many times do we see that somebody who's just having a real rough time and yet won't accept correction or instruction about how to live a better life. And they seem to almost relish in their poverty, relish in feeling like they're the victim of life. And he says here that, uh, that the way of the wicked, it is hard. The way of the treacherous is hard. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool displays folly. Uh, we pretty well know how that works, don't we? A wicked messenger falls into adversity. A faithful envoy brings healing. Uh, talking about uh, an ambassador. Uh, you know, they can betray their country or they can bring healing. They can bring peace. It's the difference between the peacemaker and the gossip who causes only trouble. And so the wicked messenger, he's going to fall into adversity. The faithful envoy is going to bring healing poverty and shame come to the one who neglects discipline but he who regards reproof will be honored that seems to go back up to verse one doesn't it almost the same thing a wise son accepts his father's discipline but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke and here poverty and shame will come to the one who neglects discipline but he who regards reproof will be honored now, once again, verses 19 through 25 is another cluster of, uh, of thought. 
teaching. Uh, and, and they seem to be focusing on the blessing of a good life. Desire realized is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to turn away from evil. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Adversity pursues sinners, but the righteous will be rewarded with prosperity. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Abundant food is in the fallow ground of the poor, but it is swept away by injustice. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is in need. Uh, desire is realized, is sweet, but it is an abomination of fools to turn away from evil. Even though they realize just how terrible their life is, it just seems like an abomination. I, I just, you know, I'm not going to be like you guys. I, why, why, you know, I, I'm going to continue my destructive addiction, my destructive habits, my destructive way of life, my destructive way of thinking. And it just seems like an abomination to turn away from that kind of wickedness to fools. And he who walks, the idea of walking is this a pattern of life, a lifestyle. The one who walks with wise men will be wise. The companion of fools will suffer harm. Be careful who you hang out with. But it's more than just who you hang out with. It's who you admire and who you desire to be like. And I think that's what he's talking about here. People will respond to this verse and say, Well, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Yes, Jesus was a friend of sinners. And you need to be able to be around sinners without being like sinners. Jesus never acted sinfully. He, he never acted like them. And he gathered those around him so that they could be changed and trans, uh, transformed. Paul refers to this in 1 Corinthians. He says, you know, I told you not to associate with uh, immoral people. And he says, I did not mean the immoral people of the world. He says, if that were the case, then you have to go out of the world. I meant the immoral people of the church. Who are we to judge those outside of the church? We judge those inside the church. And sometimes we get confused about this. I mean, why should it surprise us that sinners act sinfully? Uh, they're outside the church. They're going to be condemned by God anyway. They don't need to be condemned by us. We are more interested about those who are inside the church. How we can be transformed to be like God. Uh, those disciples that Jesus chose, they were chosen to be transformed. And that's what we're striving for is that transformation. We sing the song, Just As I Am, without one plea. And that's correct. We can come to God just as we are. The problem is we can't stay as we are. Jesus forgave the sinner, but then he told them to go and sin no more. And so, so here he's talking about this uh, desire to be like wise men will make us wise. But when you hang out with fools, don't be surprised that you start acting foolishly. Adversity pursues sinners, but the righteous will be rewarded with prosperity. Again, this idea that sinful people just can't seem to get out of their way. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. You know, my grandmother decided to become a Christian. At a time in her life when she had tuberculosis, she needed to be baptized, but the only where, place they had in that church was to go down to the river. So they went to the Ohio River, broke the ice off of the river, and she was baptized in that icy river with tuberculosis. But she knew that she needed to follow God. Do you think that decision made by my grandmother has affected me in any way? <laughs> I think so. She left me a great inheritance that continues today. And my kids will be blessed by that same kind of an inheritance that she started. Abundant food is in the fallow ground of the poor, but it's swept away by injustice. Abundant food. There's more than enough food to feed every person on earth if 
we took care of the fallow ground. We just don't plant it. <laughs> if it's planted, it'll come up and we can feed everybody. We have enough farmland to feed everybody. But so often, uh, there's injustice. There's poor management. There are poor decisions that are made. There are poor political policies that, that restrict how this ground is going to be used. And uh, But there should be enough for everybody. And it doesn't mean that you have to... Uh, Take it from the rich to give to the poor. It's not making the poor rich so that the poor can have enough. It is allowing the poor to take care of themselves. Now, sometimes uh, the rich take advantage of the poor, and that shouldn't be. Part of the problem here is what he mentions is injustice. Uh, there's injustice towards people. They don't aren't allowed to make a living sometimes. But there's a, more than enough for a food in the fallow ground of the poor. That's an interesting comment, isn't it? He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Uh, this seems to be a favorite theme of Solomon, to discipline your children, to, to take care of them. You know, so often today we see kids that just aren't disciplined at all. One of the major complaints of the school teachers is these children are just so undisciplined. And, and oftentimes parents are expecting that the school to discipline them, or the government to discipline them, or, or the churches to discipline them. But this is the job for parents, parents to discipline your children. And if you don't discipline them, it's not going to be the schools or the churches. It's going to be the court system that does it. Uh, so many people are, are in jail because their parents never love them enough to discipline them and show them the right way to live their life. And so here he's going to talk about this, and he talks about it quite a bit. Uh, he's going to talk about the need to discipline our kids. And then he says the righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is in need. Now, part of the satisfaction comes from just the idea of, uh, of contentment, that we're content with what we have. Uh, and sometimes the stomach of the wicked's in need because he always wants, 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 wants. And... Uh, and strives to get it quick and easy. And so he doesn't have what he needs. Proverbs is marvelous. And one of the things about it is these are general principles. Don't think of these as being laws or commandments. They are principles to live by. Uh, there are attitudes that we should have. There are certain attitudes and desires that will make you feel miserable. They're foolish desires and they're foolish uh, attitudes and some folks are miserable because they have these. Now, on the other hand, there are attitudes and desires that bless people and enable them to live full and rich lives. Uh, it's tragedy that there are too many fools who are suffering and they suffer and they're bitter, but they still think that they're wise. They still think they're smarter than everybody else, that they know more than everybody else. And yet they're struggling and suffering more than anybody. And on the other hand, the wise person is humble enough. He knows he's blessed, but he knows that he has a whole lot more to learn. Ah, there's so much in chapter 13. I hope I didn't go too long. I want to be able to post this today. I hope it's a blessing in your life. May God bless you all.